Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute. And I want to thank you all for coming today. Here's our Kalita. <laughs> and welcome you to a special edition of the Conservative Women's Network Lunch. Special thank you to Bridget Wagner. Um, we've been doing these lunches with Heritage now for 17 years, and every month it's fun. Now, after the election results came in last month, we decided to put together a panel of distinguished women leaders to look ahead to where our conservative ideas and policies go from here. The ladies we have with us today are experts on a variety of important policy areas, and we're delighted they could join us for this important discussion. What I'm going to do is introduce each of them now, and then we'll just ask each of them to speak for about five minutes, and then we'll open it to uh, questions. First, we have Diana Frischkopf Roth, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the director of their Economics 21 program. She's also a columnist for MarketWatch.com and Tax Notes. She recently served as a volunteer advisor to Donald Trump's presidential campaign. Diana has played a key role in our nation's economic policy planning under Presidents Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. She's the author of several excellent books, including Women's Figures, an Illustrated Guide to the Economic Progress of Women in America, and also The Feminist Dilemma, When Success is Not Enough. Her articles have been published in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal, and she's a frequent guest on television and radio shows. Second will be Jennifer Marshall, a vice president of our Heritage Foundation. Jennifer Marshall runs the think tank's Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity, and in that capacity, she oversees research into a variety of issues that determine the strength and character of American society. Her work explores how moral values and civil society relate to issues such as limited government, a strong national economy, and foreign policy. Before joining the Heritage Foundation in 2003, she worked on cultural policy issues at Empower America, a free market think tank. And before that, she was senior director of family studies at the Family Research Council, and she also taught at an American school in France. She's the author of an excellent book, Now and Not Yet, Making Sense of Single Life in the 21st Century. It's a book that evaluates the cultural, practical, and spiritual issues that marriage-minded young women confront as the age of first marriage continues to rise in America. Jennifer holds a Master of Arts in Religion from Reform Theological Seminary, a Master's Degree in Statecraft and World Politics from the Washington-based Institute of World Politics, and a Bachelor's Degree in French from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, where she also earned her teacher certification. Third, we'll have Cleta Mitchell. Cleta is a partner and a political law attorney in the Washington, D.C. office of Foley and Lardner. With more than 40 years of experience in law, politics, and public policy, Cleta advises many organizations, corporations, candidates, campaigns, and individuals on state and federal campaign finance law, on election law, and compliance issues related to lobbying, ethics, and financial disclosure. She's also the re attorney responsible for exposing Obama's IRS scandal and persuading members of Congress that conservative groups were facing abuse and harassment by a powerful government agency. Cleta represents numerous candidates, campaigns, and members of Congress, as well as state and national political party committees. And in 2008, she authored the Lobbying Compliance Handbook. Cleta has testified before Congress on numerous occasions related to election law, campaign finance and lobbying and ethics law, and is a frequent speaker and guest commentator on political law. She received her bachelor's and her Juris Doctor Law degree from the University of Oklahoma and is admitted to practice law in the District of Columbia, the State of Oklahoma, the Supreme Court of the United States, and federal district and appellate courts. And Cleta was also a Claire Booth Luce Woman of the Year a couple of years ago. <laughs> and she's in our calendar this year, too because she gives great talks to the young women. And then, last but not least, our state expert, Tracy Sharp, 
President and CEO of the State Policy Network, where she serves a 130 plus member peer network community of independent, nonpartisan, free market allies across all the states. She's been an active leader in state and local public policy since 1988, serving on the SPN Board of Directors since 1992, and she was chosen president in 1999. Under Tracy's leadership, Ship SPN has expanded to over 130 think tank members, including 65 state-focused think tanks across the states and in Puerto Rico, with combined revenues estimated at $140 million. Before joining SPN, Tracy helped launch Oregon's market-oriented state think tank, the Cascade Policy Institute, mm -hmm. in 1991. She was born and raised in central Washington state, earned a degree in history from the University of Washington, and she and her husband have two sons, now in college, empty nest, and they currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please join me in thanking these great women leaders for being with us today. And ladies, um, if you want to come up here, that's great. I like to stand and speak. If you want to sit, you can do that as well. First, Diana. Well, thank you so much for that great introduction, Michelle. And thank you so much to Bridget and Camille for setting this up. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, and thank all of you for coming. So the question before us is, what is next over the next four years for conservatives? And it's really wonderful uh, that Donald Trump got elected on a platform of low taxes and low regulation. And if you want to read his platform, it is all laid out in this book called Crippled America where he talks about repealing Obamacare, lowering taxes, getting rid of the role of teachers' unions so that there can be more educational choice, and having more legal immigration and ending illegal immigration to make our country safer. And these are all going to contribute to our country's GDP growth. And I think it's really notable uh, that the stock market jumped when uh, Donald Trump was elected because people see that there's going to be more economic growth in the future. So the question is, what is the role for all of us? What is the role for all of us in this room? Well, we have a system of checks and balances, and Donald Trump cannot do it on his own. Uh, some of the regulations that were passed during the Obama era, uh, he can roll back. And other initiatives take uh, Congress to pass legislation so that he can sign uh, the legislation into law. It's up to all of us to exert pressure on Congress and stand up for the platform that's in this book right here so that it can be achieved and so that his win will be able to accomplish everything that he said it would. So let's just take a couple of things. Obamacare, repealing the Affordable Care Act. Well, certain things can be done by regulation such as raising the hardship exemption that the Secretary of Health and Human Services was allowed to uh, impose. Uh, there's a hardship exemption. People don't have to get Obamacare if they have below a certain income. The Secretary of Health and Human Services could raise that to, say, $5 million to just immediately <laughs> stop the mandate. But that's not really good enough. Uh, what we need is a better tax system, uh, a, a, a better health care system, and different committees in the House and the Senate have been working on it, but we all need to exert pressure so that the legislation actually passes Congress rapidly so that President Trump can sign that into law. And then take tax reform. Donald Trump proposed lowering the top tax rate to 33%, the corporate tax rate to 15%. Lowering the corporate tax rate uh, is going to bring trillions of dollars into the country. By some estimates, there's $2 trillion in multinationals' earnings held offshore. Because when the multinationals bring it in, they are taxed at about 39%, minus the foreign tax that's already been paid. The average OECD tax is 25%. So just keeping that money outside uh, is a winner. And we don't want that to happen. We want that to change. And I'm sure that's part of what Donald Trump told the folks at Carrier when they were talking about moving to Mexico. 
that he is going to lower that corporate tax rate uh, so that they can bring in more money held abroad and use it to stimulate investment. But that's not something he can do on his own. Uh, the House Ways and Means, the Senate Finance, they have to get together rapidly, pass a tax bill. There was a tax bill in the first six months of George W. Bush's year in 2001. Uh, there was one in uh, the first year of Ronald Reagan's presidency. So uh, we need to make sure that that happens. That means all of you writing articles about it, which, by the way, I would be happy to publish on economics21.org. Mm -hmm. uh, I look for 800 words, uh, free market, <laughs> low regulation oriented. So uh, I'm always happy to accept your contributions and publish them. But uh, we need to be making a case that this needs to happen rapidly. Uh, immigration. Donald Trump says he wants more legal immigrants. He says he loves immigrants. He wants more legal immigration. That requires changes in the law, increases in H-1B uh, uh, caps, uh, a less burdensome system of getting immigrants into the country. You know, my son married someone who was not a United States citizen. It took her two years after the marriage to get her green card. We joke that it would be easier if she just walked across the border. I mean, it shouldn't be like this. Right. But unfortunately, it takes Congress to fix these things. Uh, education is a little bit simpler because most of it is left to states, but there's also a lot that can be done. So there's a big role for all of us in the next four years to support the principles that got Donald Trump elected to have more economic growth, and we all need to be working on it. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thanks for all of you taking time to be here. And Diana, that's a great way to set off our conversation today. Many of the things that I want to raise will expand on the topics that you've already placed on the table. Uh, obviously, one of the major themes this year has been opportunity for all. And it is time now for that to be not just a slogan. It's time for us to put conservative principles to work for all Americans. And at the top of the agenda, of course, is repealing and replacing Obamacare with an alternative that allows Americans to choose health plans that meet their needs and reflect their values. And we've identified three immediate steps to be taken uh, in order to do that and put us on a better path in terms of health care. The first one is the most obvious. Congress needs to repeal Obamacare. And it needs to do so in a way that provides for coverage to uh, not expire before a replacement is uh, ready to go. And there are a lot of scare tactics to the contrary out there right now. The second thing is that the administration simultaneously needs to take immediate actions to roll back the regulations under Obamacare that have created havoc for so many Americans. And one uh, constituency that I've been particularly focused on over the last few years are those who have had uh, religious objections to the HHS mandate. When you have nuns on the steps of the Supreme Court protesting, you know that you are doing something seriously wrong with health care. So it's time that we start making that right. The third immediate step in health care is that states need to take action in their 2017 legislative sessions to reestablish their authority for health insurance markets once Obamacare repeal is in effect. Now, it's important that they do this not in a way that returns to the status quo prior to Obamacare. States need to take leadership that expands choice and reduces the costs of coverage while promoting competition and innovation in health in healthcare. Now, this is also an extraordinary moment for expanding opportunity in education and helping more Americans overcome dependency on welfare. To do that, it's really important that we know the history and the details of the programs that we're dealing with. In the case of education, communities had schools long before the federal government ever existed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's only the last 50 years in which Washington has intervened into local schools in any significant way. Today, 10% of the funding that goes to local schools originates in Washington, but probably something more like 50% of the red tape and regulations and hassle that they have to deal with. And yet we have almost nothing to show for this history of federal interventionism in local schools. So it's important that we begin uh, the, the persevering towards reducing Washington's overreach and downsizing the federal footprint in local education. 
We've got a plan to do that. It's called A+. And we are also calling for uh, states to be free to make funding student-centered and portable. Now, the history of uh, welfare is quite different from that of education. Today we have dozens of means-tested programs that are providing assistance to poor and low-income Americans. These were created by the federal government, and they are uh, largely funded by the federal government today. And welfare programs, unfortunately, have been structured in ways that have undermined work and undermined marriage. So the first step to reducing dependency on welfare is to promote work in programs like food stamps. This is what worked so uh, famously in the 1996 welfare reform that was known as temporary assistance to needy families. Welfare roles were reduced by half. But we only, uh, we only re uh, reformed one program in that Im important uh, era, and now it's time to work methodically at reforming other programs like food stamps. We also need to eliminate uh, marriage penalties in the welfare state, which we can do beginning with the earned income tax credit. And my colleague, Robert Rector, has outlined how to do that, as well as eliminating billions of dollars worth of fraud and mistakes that are present right now in EITC. We've also proposed how to, pro how to uh, invoke federalism in the realm of welfare. And this is, a, this is a, an arena and a topic that's often un misunderstood. So we've used the case study of how it could be done in public housing to illustrate the point that we need to gradually reduce federally funded presence in public housing and restore and, and hand over the responsibility for raising revenue and managing policy to the states for them to determine to what extent and how they will meet the needs for public housing in ways that are appropriate for their local communities. Now, I've talked about these in terms that are reforms within social welfare, but it's also important to notice that the reforms in these areas will also bring about cultural good by reducing the tensions that have emerged so large on the federal stage where we can't agree on our values or beliefs. And when you have centralized welfare policy, centralized social programs in areas like healthcare and education, you, have, you set up a winner-take-all set of, of, of dimensions and, and pressures. And often, those decisions have been handed off to bureaucrats who are not elected. Take the HHS mandate that required coverage, health plans to cover uh, abortion-inducing drugs and contraception. That was the product of the HHS bureaucracy. And it has created uh, hundreds of plaintiffs going to court because their convictions were going to be violated by it. By contrast, the conservative proposal for health care reform allows Americans to make choices about the health plans that they need and that match and reflect their values. We can de-escalate many of these cultural tensions by the kinds of conservative proposals that we're bringing to the table. So another set of priorities for the new administration, this will be my last, is to undo these many unilateral actions of the Obama administration that ended up forcing its values on the rest of America. And I'm thinking uh, in particular here of the letter that was sent by the Departments of Education and, the, uh, and Justice to every school in America telling them how to run their bathroom policy with regard to gender identity issues. That needs to be immediately reversed and many of the unilateral actions like it in other agency contexts. In addition, Congress needs to take the step of passing the First Amendment Defense Act, which would prohibit the federal government from penalizing any group or individual who believes that marriage is the union of a husband and a wife. These are the kinds of steps that can be taken immediately by a new administration and very quickly by the Congress as well. We need to be clear and articulate as conservatives about why our proposals work to give greater opportunity for all in America. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. It's an, always a pleasure to be with Michelle, with Claire Booth Luce, and Bridget, and the Heritage Foundation and the Conservative Women's Network. It's great to be with you today. As an attorney, I'm going to tell you that I think the most important thing that Donald Trump can do, which is, uh, which is overarching on every issue area that we're going to talk about, and that is to restore the rule of law in America. America is a nation of laws, not of men. How many times have we heard that growing up? But what we've seen in the last eight years is a president with a cell phone and a pen who has made law as though he were an emperor.
and a complicit liberal media that has found that completely acceptable. And imagine if Donald Trump were to say, I have a cell phone and a pen. Mm. Oh, he's a dictator. He's a tyrant. We have been living under a dictatorial tyrant for the last eight years. And one of the most important things that Donald Trump can do as president is to restore the rule of law. How can he do that? Number one, to do exactly what Jennifer just said, that the education department of the federal government, imagine this is what happened. They sent a guidance letter to every school and school system and school district in America and said, if you do not allow transgenders to use, I don't even really know what that is, thank you. I am old and I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. But that they, if they did not stop respecting privacy of the children in our schools, they would lose their federal funds. And the Department of Justice says, and we will enforce this letter. Well, strong letter to follow, hopefully, from the new Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, to say, disregard the earlier communication. That wasn't a rule. It wasn't a regulation. It was a guidance letter. And the agencies, I've been watching some of these agencies racing to establish new regulations before the Obama administration is over. The new administration of Donald Trump and the Republican Congress needs to take every action possible to rescind, halt, and do away with all those regulations. I listened to uh, President-elect Trump last night in his speech in Indiana at the carrier plant and said, interestingly, that he had been surprised as he traveled around the country during the campaign that he had always thought that the number one uh, concern of business leaders would be taxes. He said, what I'm learning is the number one concern that leader, business leaders have is regulation. Mm -hmm. The regulatory state, which has metastasized under this administration, we must repeal the regulations and we must create new safeguards against this m massive executive regulatory overreach, and that is going to require some significant work on the part of conservatives. Um, the Federalist Society has a project that it is undertaking at the moment, which is to develop, actually, and I have to say it's pretty interesting, because when we started this last year, or earlier this year, um, I think all of us felt as though there was no way that we could ever really do anything about it, that we were going to have to create some kind of public support, by telling stories about these horrible excesses and getting public support to then help try to fight back and all. And it's interesting because after this election, all of a sudden we think, well, wow, we might actually be able to make, to be successful. But these regulatory excesses cut across every federal agency. We, and, you know, one of the things that, there are so many egregious examples of how our government has become almost like the former Soviet Union, picking winners and losers where the commissars live well and everybody else uh, is just subject to the rule of the state. So we have a lot of work to do, and we need to change some legal doctrines that have permitted courts and allowed courts to uphold presumptions of legitimacy by federal agencies rather than putting the burden on the federal agency to justify why a regulatory prom a, a statement or action is proper. The burden should not be on the citizen. It should be on the government. We've got a lot of work to undo really what is uh, 40 years 40 years of metastasizing federal government. And of course, I can't ever talk without, I have two more points I want to make. One, I want to mention, what should the new president do about the IRS? As uh, Michelle mentioned, I represented a number of groups who were targeted by the IRS. 
I think that, the, that Donald Trump should demand John Koskinen's resignation as IRS commissioner on the first day that Donald Trump becomes president. John Koskinen should never have been appointed or confirmed as IRS commissioner in the first place. This is a person who was nominated and confirmed at a time when the, within six months after the Treasury Inspector General had found this targeting, had confirmed, some of us knew it was going on, but confirmed that indeed it was happening. And John Koskinen, had given over $55,000 to Democrats in the 10 years preceding his appointment as IRS commissioner. He was a maxed out Obama donor, a maxed out Hillary Clinton donor, a maxed out John Kerry donor, had given to the Democratic National Committee and should never, he was clearly a partisan and should never have been put in that position. And once he was put in that position, on the day he was sworn in, the IRS was under subpoena to turn over documents and materials, email, including emails. I, he was, the IRS had, had received a subpoena six months earlier from the House Committee on Oversight and uh, Government Reform for all of that material. And he presided over the destruction of the information that was under subpoena and then lied about it on more than one occasion to the Congress. Perjury, lying to Congress, is perjury. And he should have been impeached and removed from office, but Donald Trump should demand his resignation and appoint someone in that very highly sensitive position that understands that the job of the commissioner of the IRS is to collect revenues and not target people for their political beliefs and then cover up for Democrats in, uh, after it's over. And the final thing I will say is that we talk as conservatives always about substantive issues. We talk about the economy, we talk about education, health care, and welfare policy. Let us not forget what we are facing. We are facing a hostile media, hostile left-wing uh, commentators, liberal academics, uh, left-wing professors, you know, whiny crybabies on the college campuses. I mean, do you realize that yesterday, every, I mean, this has been going on for decades, where Harvard hosts the key uh, decision makers in campaigns to come after the election, they all agree to come, to talk about the campaigns. Steve Bannon was a key decision maker in the Trump campaign who was supposed to show up and at the end did not go because of the protesters at Harvard. So he didn't go. So guess what? That voice is silenced. Now, the media ought to be up in arms about that. They ought to say, you morons, go home. We want to actually hear from him. But no, they don't do that. And then, of course, I'm sure you've all seen the news coverage of what... Uh, Hillary's campaign manager said to Kellyanne Conway, well, it's fine, it's fine. Let's let them not uh, have a clue what happened in this election. That's fine with me. But what I think is really important is that we have got to, as conservatives, realize that we can't just be out promoting the policies. We have got to recognize we need to fight these people. And we need to fight them in ways that defunds them. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I will tell you, I'm going to be working to do what I can do to find the ways that we can cut off their lifeblood, which is taxpayer-supported um, money flowing into the unions. I'll give you two examples. Remember what happened with Scott uh, Walker and Act 10 mm -hmm. after he was elected governor? When he promoted, pushed through with $100,000 protester, 100, protesters from all over the country who descended upon Wisconsin, tried to cut, shut that all down. Well, in the final analysis, they got the bill passed. It was upheld by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And since that time, and what the bill did was it, revi it re reformed their collective bargaining, but one of the things it said was that no longer would the state and the school districts collect the dues for people to be, me be members of the union. That the union would be just like any other organization, like the Heritage Foundation, any of the groups represented here, people have to write a check to join. They write a check to provide support. And there's no government agency collecting money for the Heritage Foundation to be supported. And so the unions had to do the same thing. They knew what was at stake. That's why they were protesting. And since that time, more than they've lost 
nearly half of their membership and substantial tens of millions of dollars that they would otherwise have spent on political activity that they didn't have in 2014 when Scott Walker was reelected and that they didn't have in 2016 when Ron Johnson was reelected and Donald Trump carried Wisconsin. If you don't think that these things make a difference, they make a difference. And we need to find, we need to have Congress provide pro, uh, statutory language to prohibit unions from receiving lists and money through any kind of Medicaid dollars that go to the states. Right now, the SEIU, I mean, one of the things that we need to realize, we need to look at the process in the political landscape. There's a real divide in the country, in the un within unions, and between and among unions. Those blue-collar workers that voted for Donald Trump, they're not government employees. The growth in the union movement has been with public employees, not with trade unions. And they've basically been forgotten by the Democratic Party because the lifeblood of the Democratic Party, as far as unions are concerned, are, are, the, are the ways that they've been going in and organizing government employees. And, and they have, the SEIU has been ingenious at identifying new bargaining units. And one of the things they've done, I'll give you an example of Washington State, one of the things they've done is they have just decided, you know, there are these ways that you can become a home care provider, whether you're a daycare provider, you can get Medicaid money for that, Title 20 money, you can, if you get, um, if you, you can be a care provider to take care of a sick family member or disabled family member. And the SEIU decided that they would just get that list of all those licensed stake uh, workers who are really in-home providers and make them part of the SEIU. And so the Freedom Foundation in Washington State obtained the list and started advising these people of their right not to have to join the union. Of course, now the SEIU has created, you know, filed all these lawsuits and all, but Congress needs to take a, a moment and pay attention and say, you can no longer receive lists. If you're, you know, those, those lists cannot, you, we're not gonna use your money we're not going to use tax money to subsidize the unions. But we have to be thinking about those things. We have a short period of time to try to understand where their money comes from and how to fight it. And we better be thinking about some of those what I call process issues, or we will not be able to continue to fight on the substantive issues. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, Bridget. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invite. State Policy Network is the incubator, the accelerator, and the connector of the state-based think tanks across the country. Our 130 associates and affiliates also see us as a defender of the network as well in terms of defending their free speech and their rights to associate, which Cleta mentioned some of it, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But let's start with the post-election numbers showing that voters didn't just reject progressive ideas and progressive leadership at the federal level, but at the state level over the last three election cycles, state voters have elected more candidates who advocate for conservative and free market ideas and principles. It is a state moment. Here's just a few numbers. And these have been fluctuating because some are undecided, but I'll just give you a quick snapshot. There are 33 Republican governors, 15 Democrat, a couple in recount, one independent. That's the most Republican governors since 1922. However, something to take into account to tell you our time is short. 36 governor races will be held in 2018. 17 of those governors are term limited and mostly in red states. So my first point is we're going to have to act fast if we want to move to make changes. Some say we have a two-year window. Some say a one-year. Some say 100 days. We are going to have to move quickly. For the state legislatures, 32 states are controlled by Republicans, 13 Democrat split. Again, some of these are yet to be decided. But the important number for you to remember is that there are 25 states that they call Republican trifectas. 
that's where the, the governor is Republican and the state House and the state Senate are controlled. The majorities are controlled by Republicans. This is a lot of leverage. The Democrats have six. So if we're going to move legislation across several states, now is the time. Now we have to pay attention to some of the ballot initiative results too. Uh, they can't be ignored. It, I think it really helps put this in context because it was a mixed bag of results. As you may have heard, four states passed minimum wage laws. Uh, South Dakota and Missouri and a few other jurisdictions passed tougher restrictions on donor disclosure, meaning if you're a C3, you need to report some of the names of your donors to the government. And the, the legalization of marijuana in some form or another passed in seven of nine states. So my second point is that the states are still actively experimenting, right? They're still those, they are still the laboratories of democracy. And that spirit of experimentation is also good news for us too. But we have to get busy. Time's short, time to get moving. So I, we have to remember, while there were a lot of election gains with the GOP, this is no guarantee that we can affect change. And I'll quote from Peggy Noonan of the Wall Street Journal, who said that political actors won't change until they're, quote, concussed into changing. It's a lot of fight for the status quo. And a lot of what our state think tanks do is introduce new ideas and create a pressure for real change. So there's a lot of areas policy-wise that need to be concussed. And that's where our state think tanks have laid the groundwork. State Policy Network has been proactive in creating peer networks, toolkits, messaging across several key policy aid, um, areas to accelerate this. Really, for such a time as this, the state think tanks and our allies in the states are ready. As Jennifer mentioned, uh, for health care, the states have a lot of work to do to smooth out the playing field, untangle those insurance <laughs> mandates. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, too, on the supply side to make it easier for direct care and um, for, so consumers can have more options and access. For K-12 education, uh, uh, devolving power to the states is a big, what we'll be pushing for. Fully 26 states are looking to introduce some sort of legislation for education savings accounts, ESAs. So watch for that. I think it's important more and more states are working with legislators to help meet parents where they're at. Some states would prefer a charter, some tax credit. A lot of states are looking at ESAs. For public sector unions, as Cleta mentioned, we do have momentum here. And as such, you may have heard of Rebecca Friedrichs for the, the Friedrichs Supreme Court case that we did not win. But we have put, uh, State Policy Network has put Rebecca Friedrichs on as a near full-time contractor and we're sending her around out in the states to educate about education reform, and she's a teacher, and public sector reform. It's about worker freedom and giving workers more choice. She's a great advocate for that. For tax and budget, a lot of that is uh, going to be framed up through the reference as, do, does this tax or budget or regulatory reform legislation, does it create jobs or does it drive jobs out of the state? It's a lot easier to understand those pieces of legislation when you look at it through that window. And really, that's what the average American is really concerned about, is job security and security and just having their voice heard. Uh, finally, I'll wrap up with a little uh, bit about donor privacy and free speech, which Cleta had talked about. And I mean, Cleta has been very helpful for our work. Um, the fact is, if we cannot protect our generous donors' privacy and safety, if we cannot protect the time value tradition of anonymity in this country, we cannot complete the tasks at hand. We'll need to play defense and offense to tell our story that every American has the right to support causes they believe in without fear of repercussions or intimidation or bullying. You know, we are the movement of free minds and free markets, but we're also the movement of free speech. We are the ones that are going to have to stand up for this. It continues to be an unpredictable political environment, for sure. It's a great time of, well, it's a time of great churn, socially, culturally, economically. In the midst of all this uncertainty, though, we have to see it creates opportunity for us. 
we need to keep this momentum going to balance power at all, all levels of government, right? The founders knew this day would come when the states would have to flex their constitutional muscle to balance power. So much power has been concentrated at, at the federal level and in the office of president. Now is that state moment. And finally, I'll just say, look, the left knows that the power is in the states too. And they're going to be ramping up and accelerating their efforts in the states. So the race is on. Uh, and they, who will gain traction with these experiments? So for us out in the state, now is the time to drive our work through this window of opportunity so all individuals and communities can flourish. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tracy, all of these wonderful ladies. Isn't it great to have these people on our side? <laughs> we were talking earlier about back in the 70s when I started and the 80s, and there were just a lot fewer conservative ladies at the podium. It's a wonderful thing now, and so many young future leaders as well. It's great to have you all here. We have a little bit of time for questions. Um, who's got the mic? Uh, Lisa? From uh, she's a fall fellow at Claire Booth Luce and Kimberly. Kimberly, um, if you raise your hand and uh, uh, this one is waving here, give your name and affiliation, and who you'd like to answer the question. Okay, hi, Penny Star with CNS News. Um, I, I guess this is for Diana, but anyone else can weigh in if they'd like to. The carrier announcement and speech um, was hailed by some, but there were critics who said this worries them because it means that. Trump is going to pick uh, winners and losers, intimidate businesses, use taxpayer money to affect things without going through certain channels. So I wondered if you could respond to that. Thank you. Sure. Well, I think that the incentives came from the state of Indiana. And states uh, have given incentives in the past and will continue to do so to their different, to different businesses. And of course, it's not right to uh, extort or shame any uh, uh, companies, but I think it's clear that Donald Trump said that there was a new era coming. He was planning on lowering regulations and lowering taxes, uh, streamlining some of these very, very burdensome regulations, and that they should just hold on and see what happened. And I think many companies are going to be waiting. Uh, many companies have what's called inverted which is become uh, joined up with a foreign company and become actually a subsidiary of that foreign company to get that foreign tax rate. Now, with our tax going down potentially to 15%, there's going to be other companies that are going to want to invert to become American to take advantage of our tax rate. And I think it behooves all these companies to know that Donald Trump is serious, the Congress is going to back him up, and I think that's what he told Carrie, and that's what he's telling these different companies, that they shouldn't think that the next four years are going to be like the past eight. Um, here on the end. Hi, good morning. My name is Pagona. I'm with the Ladies of Liberty Alliance. I have a question. I, I would love an answer from whoever, um, of the panel. But what do you think that, that, what do you think are the best ways that we can get these ideas in front of new and broader audiences? And what do you think that women can do? What role can they play in doing that? Well, I, I'm a very big believer. I actually, you know, I work with campaign. I represent campaigns and consultants and uh, deal with con political consultants. I will tell you that I think a problem that re Republicans and conservatives have, because it's the Republicans that deliver these messages, is that all of our uh, media consultants who get paid the big bucks and make all the money to do all the communicating for the campaigns are all men. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a campaign where, I, it's, I, you know, I'm the lawyer and maybe the finance director is a woman, and and we'll say, uh, hey, guys, have you thought about uh, doing an ad that tells people why they should vote for this candidate instead of just beating up on the other guy? And they look at you like you're crazy, and they don't do it. So I'm actually thinking that what we need to do, <laughs> I'll just tell you, you know, I think that we need to figure out how to fund creating a, a media consulting group that does communications for campaigns and all that, even if they just, that are, are targeted to new audiences, are targeted to women and uh, 
younger people and all. I, I, you know, I'm just telling you that these middle-aged and older white guys are are not doing the job as far as I'm concerned. And they and we spend, if you look at it, most of the money in a campaign is spent paying media guys, although not the Trump campaign. <laughs> That's what was so great about it. Um, but so many of, and I've said this for years, you know, look, they're doing our communicating for us and they're not communicating some of these principles. I'll give you a couple of, let me give you a couple of good examples of what I'm talking about. Number one, I'll give you three examples. I know people, I know women who worked for Donald Trump. I have a, a friend in Pinehurst, North Carolina, who worked for him for 13 years. And she said, he was a wonderful boss. He was great to work for. It was a complete meritocracy. He didn't care what color you were, what gender you were. You needed to be smart, bring your A game every day, work hard. And if you did that, you were promoted and you did well. If you were a screw up, you didn't, you're fired. Um, did we ever hear anybody do a bunch of communications, interviewing a lot of the people that work for Donald Trump and telling those stories? No, we did not. Um, partial birth abortion is an 80% issue. People are opposed to murdering babies. 80%. It cuts across all demographic lines. Moderate Democrats conservative Democrats, independents, young people, old people, do you believe that it should be the law that an eight-month baby can be aborted and killed? And, you know, people just are not for that. Did you see any ads about that? I actually believe one of the reasons Donald Trump won was because both he and Mike Pence were so strong on that issue during the debates, and I'd never seen that before. And people heard that, even though the media missed it and didn't pay attention to it. And the third thing is school choice. That is a 90% issue, and particularly in minority communities. Do you think any of our consultants ever do ads about that? So we have principles. We just got to find a way to get the money that is spent communicating these ideas to actually communicate them. Well, I'd like to say that um, Anne Stone is in the audience, and she was spearheading Women for Trump, and I was helping her out with it. And we did have a lot of women organized in all the different 50 states uh, to talk about the advantages of a Trump win. And I think also it's the media does not cover it. And if you go to our website, uh, economics21.org, uh, uh, I run the website. I'm happy to publish anything that you write. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, 800 words, good pieces <laughs> about this, these issues. You can then tweet them out, get them on social media, and you can be involved too. Yeah, I think going to non-traditional sources of communication, building digital communities, the outcome of the election told us there are huge swaths of people who don't feel heard. The average American, the little guy, doesn't feel like they have a voice. Technology can give them a voice. Build a digital community around an issue. That's what you can go direct to the consumer in that way and keep driving it and give them things to do, productive things to do. And I would bring that home to our uh, policy issues and the coalitions that we build around them to think in terms of diversity of disciplines. Uh, we, uh, let me talk about poverty, which is a subject I've worked on a lot over the years, and the, we don't have the luxury of having a policy that fits neatly into a soundbite like spend more money and start a new program. That's the liberal approach to fighting poverty. Ours is very, because it is about the human person at the center and human need is complex, the answers turned out to be complex. There are reforms we want to see at the federal government to help point people towards self-sufficiency. There are state leadership opportunities to do the same. And there are lots of community groups that are doing that work on the ground. So what we did was to uh, start an annual conference, an anti-poverty forum that we hosted just before Thanksgiving, and we do it annually, get on the calendar for next year, um, that, that we bring all these people into the same room. Because at the, at the beginning of this, we weren't even recognizing that we were on the same team trying to advance the same things in the country because our disciplines are so different from one another. If you're talking about a guy who's working with heroin addicts at a shelter, he may not be aware of the welfare reform bill in Washington that really matters. And I think when you see uh, a diversity of discipline, you also get all kinds of other uh, diversities that make us healthier and make sure we are providing opportunity for all. Excellent answers. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, Kathy and then Anne and then Lisa. How about that? 
Kathy. Thanks. I have an election integrity question for Cleta and for Tracy. Um, Cleta, do you think that there's going to be substantial change of personnel in the Department of Justice, uh, which has been harassing to election integrity efforts in states, particularly with photo ID? And Tracy, um, Barack Obama and Eric Holder have formed a PAC that is going to go after districting, congressional districting in states. Are states going to be prepared to fight them? And uh, if not, oh, then go why ahead, aren't Clayton. they? Well, I think that, that those are really, these are process questions, and, it's, and Kathy's always very smart to think about these things. Um, look, I mean, the Department of Justice is a disaster. And that has to be, you know, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that uh, Senator Jeff Sessions has been nominated to be the Attorney General. And he is dedicated to the rule of law. And of course, they will smear him endlessly. So everybody ought to be talking to your senators. Um, we need to make sure that he is confirmed and confirmed early. Um, I certainly think that probably what should happen is Hans von Spakovsky should be nominated to be the head of the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Justice mm -hmm. because then all the career people would quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, and they would quit. And, um, and he is an expert on all of these things and knows, uh, has been in the Department of Justice in the belly of the beast and knows how terrible it is. We can't be afraid to take on the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Justice. And quite frankly, both Ronald Reagan and the Bushes, you know, never, that, that has been a wholly owned subsidiary of the left, and Republicans have been afraid to touch it because they knew they were be called racist. Well, we're all racist now, right? I mean, you know, they call us all racist. So if you vote for Donald Trump, you are racist. So just get over it, and then let's go do the work that needs to be done. And um, the Department of Justice has been, um, it, it, it is hard to fathom. If you ha it is a federal crime for a non-citizen to register. It is a separate federal crime for a non-citizen to cast a vote. And yet, in the days leading up to the general election, we had the President of the United States urging illegals to register and vote, to commit federal crimes. You know, we have a lot to deal with, a lot to deal with. And we need, we've got to rebuild the judiciary because some of the circuit courts that used to be good are no longer good because of Obama's eight years, and we have 90 vacancies, and we need to get constitutional conservatives in those positions, the trial courts, the appellate courts, the Supreme Court, and restore the rule of law. Cleta, speaking about the rule of law, uh, is it possible for the secretary of um, HHS, the full incoming secretary Price, to pass a regulation that says that Medicaid money uh, that goes to companion carers or carers uh, has to be delivered specially directly to them without having the union dues taken out. Is Does he have the authority to do that? Well, I think by regulation? I, I think that the I think they do, but I think Congress ought to pass it. There's no reason for Congress not to pass it. I mean, mm -hmm. but there are things like that that I think that should be statutorily enshrined so they can't be repealed later, but I certainly don't. I think we have to do something. A lot, we have to do all of those things and we have to think in terms of being very tough and going after them because they're not going to let up. So there's no reason to tiptoe around these leftists. Yeah, as far as your question about redistricting and Holder and Obama's plans to go into the states and, and uh, manage that to some degree, no, I would not say the states are ready, uh, not that they couldn't get ready, they can get ready. but uh, encouraging signs are more Republican Secretary of States were elected this cycle, and we have some very, very, we have the majority Republican attorneys general and uh, I, was, I was talking to Leonard Leo, he's like, some, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's in the high 20s of, of Republican AGs. He's like, 12 of them you'd want at this meeting, six of them you'd invite to dinner, and three or four of them you'd want your daughter to marry, right? So we have some great, we have some great AGs that can help us out in the States, so, and it, so they're tooling up right now. Okay, Anne and then Lisa, and then we may be out of time after that. So many things, but I'll try to cut it down. First, I want to take an opportunity to thank Diana for the great job that she did. And notice her book with all the post-it notes. I just love that. We had pictures of it we used to send around. Uh, when people said women were mindlessly voting for Donald Trump, uh, she proves that's not the case. I also want to thank Cleta Mitchell for the part she did in helping keep some of the groups legal that yeah. uh, we had out there. And the truly unknown story of Women for Trump 
is how organic it was, how yes. we had groups springing up, yes. we harnessed them, we added to them. Um, we had, the, the campaign had one bus tour with the family that was going around. We had about five or six others that we generated. They were raising their own money yeah. and going out on the road. We had groups like that um, in some of the states, they were the state operation, raising their own money. And this is some, a story that's not been told. We had surrogates that were absolutely wonderful, people very unusual that you don't normally see out there. I won't go into all that, I won't take up the time, but I did definitely want to. And also Becky Norton Dunlop, who was one of our surrogates. But there were a lot of people that normally would have helped us and just didn't like Trump. So we had a tough time, and, but we had some wonderful stars come forward uh, to help us. And at one point, I actually had more non-white uh, surrogates than I had white. Um, which is, again, another untold story because especially black women were waking up to the fact that they were sold a bill of goods with Obama and that their lives and their families' lives had gotten worse. And that truly is an un unknown story. But Diane and I were given the uh, task of raising the percentage of women supporting Trump, specifically white women. When we started, it was 28% white women. It ended up 52%, so I think we did a pretty good job. Um, past that, though. And those thanks, I wanted to uh, ask Cleta specifically, others may know, under Reagan, we had a defund the left program. Yes. And of course, we didn't have the Congress at that time. Limited ability because across the different agencies, money was be given out to all these liberal groups and nobody was tracking it across agencies. Did it ever get changed where all the stuff was being entered in uh, data-wise with the same markers? So now that we could tie that across agencies, to find out where these people are getting their money? Do you know if that was ever done? You know, there have been little pieces of that done, but to my knowledge, nobody has ever absolutely done that. And look, I mean, let me give you an example of some of a way that is just, to me, very nefarious. But you read all of these uh, settlements, multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar settlements that the Department of Justice will go after a big bank. Remember when the, uh, the administration forced uh, Merrill Lynch to acquire Countrywide? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after they did that, then sued them, fined them a few years later mm -hmm. for acquiring Countrywide mm -hmm. and paying you know, millions of dollars. Then the Department of Justice has taken, in many, many instances, taken money that they've been basically extorted from these companies and given it to left-wing groups. Mm -hmm. right. Now, well, those are the kinds of those are the things we have to. Those yeah. are the things yeah. the Federalist Society is working on documenting. But we we need to do much more. We need to figure out the ways um, that they get government contracts. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood, we all know, gets huge amounts of government money in ways that is so hidden away we don't even know. And, and, but there are, there are just a plethora of those groups and they get money from all these different agencies and we really have got to defund them and we've got to do these procedural things about checkoffs and dues collections and that kind of thing. Yeah, we need to do the, we need to look for institutional we reforms do. we can do now that we have yes. all three branches. Right. They've just done it with Volkswagen, by the way. They're making them use their settlement money for electric vehicles. Ah. Yeah, they're making them spend that on electric cars, which See, is a big left-wing cause. Okay, last question is Lisa. I'll make this quick. I um, specifically just had a question for you, Ms. Jennifer. Um, it's actually a little bit about language. Recently, I've noticed, especially probably, you know, more so with Trump being the nominee and then vice president-elect, I feel like before uh, our politicians and various conservative groups used to use the language repeal Obamacare, and now we're saying repeal and, and replace Obamacare. I'm wondering what that language shift is about and why it is we're no longer focusing on just re repealing Obamacare and having privatized again. Why are we trying to replace it with something else and still have government involved? Great question, good. Um, so uh, before Obamacare, there was a messy healthcare system and that was in dire need of reform. And unfortunately, we got Obamacare, which made things worse. And so what Replace is about is talking about what were the reforms that should have been done in the first place to solve real problems of cost and lack of portability and other aspects of, of uninsurance in the, in the healthcare system. Now's the time to do that. Uh, the liberals have been going around saying, you just want to smash up the system. You don't have a plan. That's utter 
utterly untrue. Uh, healthcare experts at the Heritage Foundation and elsewhere have been working for years and years and years to develop very specific plans that are now actionable and that will provide a better opportunity for true insurance markets to emerge under state authority. Uh, so, so one thing that conservatives have to recognize is that uh, on an issue like education or an issue like health care, where there is federal policy that we uh, do not like and do not think are serving uh, the Americans well, we actually have to take federal action to undo that damage and free up good constitutional authorities to act in its place. Mm -hmm. And also because people are worried about it. They think, okay, uh, the Republicans want to repeal Obamacare, so I'm not going to have any more health insurance. So it's more reassurance. Quite mm -hmm. a lot of this is how we sell things. And all the replacement are more in the idea of block granting the funds to states so that states can figure out who needs subsidies. It's very much along the lines of what uh, our Chairman Price has been recommending all along. What an excellent discussion, four great leaders up here. What a good audience and really outstanding questions as well. Let's thank our panelists and then we have some gifts. For each of you ladies, we have the limited edition Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute <laughs> coffee right. with thank her famous so saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hot yeah. off the presses, our 2017 Great American uh -huh. Conservative Women Calendar, including the great Cleta Mitchell. Wow. And then for each of you, a tote. Thank a woman can never have enough of these. That's, That's true. true. There you go. So <laughs> Thank you. We also have a, a small gift from the Heritage Foundation, which I'll leave in the back for you all. And we invite you all to join us um, out in the, um, in the lobby for lunch where we can continue the conversation. But thank you all for being here, and thanks for joining us online. And we'll see you um, on December 16th for our annual male uh, CWN speaker. And this year, we're going to have Tom Fitton, who's president of Judicial Watch, who has done such an incredible job in uh, revealing the corruption um, in the government. So we hope you can join us on Friday, December 16th for the, the, um, the next Conservative Women's Lunch. Yes, and what a, an honor that uh, the left group, they, when they got together uh, right after the election, they said, we need to form our own left-wing judicial watch. <laughs> <laughs> so come join us and you can meet Tom Fenton. Thanks again. Thanks.